Well, let's get started. Um, this is the Ace Football Academy. We are here with Coach Katie Smith. Um, Katie just told us that she has just recently, actually starts tomorrow, as the assistant at Arkansas State University. Kate, thank, Katie, thanks for being here with us. Yeah, for sure. Katie, we've been kind of just talking in general about tryouts. Really what we've kind of been joking about with other coaches is – at the end of all this, after talking to players, after talking to coaches, we want to build the perfect tryout, even though we know there's no such thing. But that's kind of what our goal is, is what, what does a perfect tryout look across all levels, but really just in general? So start with us. And I know it's a little different for you at the collegiate level with tryouts versus recruiting, but start by just kind of giving us a background of how you ended up at Arkansas State. Yeah, so I started off at a really small private school in the middle of nowhere, and that was about three years ago, and my career has progressed pretty quickly since then, so I was there for a year and a half. I began coaching club at the same time, and I was at a small club as well, and then I got my D license because in Tennessee, it's required to coach club, so you can only defer for one year, so I worked on that, finished that, had a lot of success in my year and a half at that private school. So then I got offered a job at Collierville High School, which is one of the top programs here in Tennessee. And then alongside that, I got offered. So I was an assistant coach for their high school girls. I was the head coach of their middle school boys. And then I got offered a job with Lobos Rush, which is one of the bigger clubs in Tennessee as well. So I took over two teams for them. And then through that, I got offered a job at Northwest Mississippi Community College, which is where I was at this previous year. So in the past year, I was doing all of those things while finishing school, while finishing my C license. So in May, I graduated with my bachelor's. Two days later, started my master's degree. And by some a bit of luck and a lot of hard work, wound up getting offered a job at Arkansas State. And so now I'm going into that role with the intention of trying to continue to kind of climb up the ladder, so to speak. And eventually one day I would like to be at a D1 program as a head coach. And that's kind of the goal. So just trying to put myself in spaces to learn and grow and prepare for that. I know doing a little research um, on you and listening to some other podcasts that you've been on are, um, are you with the boys or the girls at Arkansas state? Cause I know you have experience on both sides. Yeah, so I'll be with their women's team there. But like you said, I have coached on both sides, men's and women's, and then boys and girls and youth as well. All right, so let's dive into some tryout discussion. Um, Coach, feel free to dive in whenever you need to. Um, Just the first question is just very basic. Like if you, and you've been at some top clubs, it sounds like you've been around some programs that I'm sure have interesting tryouts. So just kind of walk us through what you envision the tryout process to be. So for me personally, and you say the perfect tryout, it's really simple. Just let them play. Bring them in, warm them up just for making sure that they're ready to go, no injuries, and then let them play. I think that kids do their best when they're playing the game. And I think that when you get to tryouts and kids get nervous and you have all these technical drills or all of these tactical situations where maybe they're not used to it or they've never played club or whatever, they may struggle. But the reality is you're going to see a kid at their best when they're playing the game. So just letting them come in, letting them play and watching them in a game-like situation. You might not be the most technical player, but you may be able to be in every single right space on the field during a game. And if you can do that, I can teach you the technical piece. So I think just for me, letting them play, observing, and then picking your best players from that. That's not the typical way that things go, but that is how I run tryouts when I'm in charge. And that's how I believe tryouts should be run if you want to see kids at their best. Well, let me dig a little bit deeper into that. One thing we discussed in a previous conversation with a a DOC from a club in Maryland is he doesn't do any full-size field scrimmages. So are you on the same, like the same page as saying it should be 3v3, 4v4, 5v5 in the tryouts, a little age specific, or would you like to see a full field scrimmage when you have a tryout going on. Yeah, so when I'm in charge of tryouts, I'm not saying you can't go small-sided. You may start on a 3v3 or a 5v5 if you need to get some players isolated just to watch them. 
But really for me, it's mainly 11 v 11. We're going full field. We're seeing them in a, as close to a game situation as we can possibly get. So what I've done in the past is they'll come in, they'll warm up. We'll go 11 v 11. They'll play. We might get through a day or two of tryouts that way. And then there might be some players that either they're not getting enough touches on the ball. You need to evaluate them more. Well, how do you do that? You put them in a small side of the game, right? So now you mix up the teams based on who you need to look at. You know who you're trying to evaluate. Obviously, you don't want to make it obvious to all the kids there. But you do it in a way that you know the system. And then you can watch those kids on a small side and see them get more touches on the ball if needed. But for me, I mean, if you could evaluate them just 11 v 11, you're going to be better off because that's what – you need them that's where you need them to perform when they get on your team yeah, yeah so, i think that's really interesting go ahead coach one last thing on that so are you looking more at like the high school age doing full field or let's say you 12 and below are you also doing full field for them as well or are you kind of mixing it up a little bit on the younger ages yeah, so for me, full field would be middle school and high school because that's what they play on, right? So 11 v 11. As you go younger, I would say the same things apply. But for me, and I know we're going to get into this question later, but when you get into elementary school, I don't really believe in cutting kids at that age. So essentially for me, tryouts really don't matter that much. It's more just kind of getting them in, getting them playing. So I would still recommend the same thing. They're playing their full field. So if they play 9v9 at that age, they should be playing 9v9 at tryouts. It gets them excited. It gets them playing the game, gets them familiar to you, the club, and kind of just gives them an easy transition in. And you're not making cuts at that age, so you don't really need to evaluate them, so to speak. And then as you get older in middle school and high school, yes, you go 11v11 because that's where they're going to be on your team. Very interesting. It um, is – a different way to look at it, um, you know, the people that we have spoken to have started in those small sided and kind of built up to the full size level or wh whatever it is, whatever age group they are. Um, but I find it interesting going backwards, starting in the full size, because you're right. Um, number one, that's what they want to do. They just want to play. You know, they don't want to be dribbling through cones or dribbling, you know, whatever it is. They, they want to get on the field and they want to play. Um and so kind of working from that picture and then back into the small side of games, I find that really interesting. Let's yeah, and I think the intention there is like you start with the larger games and if you can evaluate everyone in those games, that's great. But the reality is you're going to have kids that they just don't get touches on the ball. And sometimes those are good players that mm -hmm. just the way the scrimmage goes or they're not teammates with the kids already so they don't get past the ball. And so you can put them in those situations smaller to evaluate their individual skills, their technical skills, whatever. But I think if we can go full field the whole time, that's fantastic. But sometimes you've got to pull it back just so you can get a deeper evaluation on certain players. But ultimately, that would be after you recognize that the 11 v 11 isn't showcasing them in the way that you need them to be. So within your 11 v 11 full field tryout, so are you – um, how are you doing your teams? Are you mixing teams? Are you putting like returning players together? Are you just constantly moving? Okay, hey, now you're going to play with blue and you're going to go red. W what does that look like for you? So I like to mix them up. And I think that this is one of my biggest issues with tryouts. And once again, it kind of goes into another question that you're going to ask about at some point. But I am really against like taking the returning players and putting them together or the top team and keeping them together. Because I think ultimately every year when you try out, it should be a blank slate, right? We should be reevaluating from like if we never knew any of these kids who are the best players and those are the ones that should go on the top team. And I think this is something that in the club space you don't see enough. It's a very political game. As we know, if you're on a top team, it's going to take an act of God to drop you down, right? So I think – being able to mix those kids in and let them play with different people. And then as the tryout goes, switching people around, you're able to showcase each player more and give them a more, a different game situation than they would have playing with people that they're used to, right? A kid's going to look a lot better when they're surrounded by five of their teammates than maybe people they don't know. So I think it's important to mix them up so that you can see their individual skill versus them just playing off of someone that they've been teammates with for years. And what about position wise, especially let's just say we're, we're running a middle school tryout. So we're looking at, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old. That's usually about the time you start to see those, um, 
for lack of a better word, specialized positions. So are you, are we questioning players? Hey, where do you like to play? Hey, where, you know, are, are we doing that? Or are we just saying, Hey, I want you to go try center mid. Hey, I want you to go try left back. What does that look like? So for me, my opinion at the middle school level is that they should still be playing more than one position. Now, like you said, you're going to have some kids that are super specialized, but that doesn't mean you can't get them reps in at a different spot just because it helps give them a broader understanding of the game. If I play center back and I play center mid, and then I get into high school and I'm a center back for my team, I can direct my center mid because I've been there, I've done that, right? And so I think the more places you can get them in, the more you're able to help them understand the game. But the reality is some of their skill sets or physical attributes or whatever are going to give them a leg up in certain areas of the field. So what I do is I tell the kids when they come in, I'm like, hey, I don't care what position you normally play in. I will put you wherever I see fit. However, for tryouts, I'm going to just move you around because I don't know, you, right? So I'm going to be like, you guys, you're you 11 set up in a four, three, one, four, three, three. I don't care who goes where you're all going to move around anyways. So just go play somewhere. Usually they're going to go to their preferred spot at first. And as the tryout goes, we'll switch them. Okay. If you're on offense, go on defense, right? If you're playing an attacking player, go switch with the defensive, whatever. And so we kind of get, once again, that full view of that player in different positions with different players, what they can do in a game. And so for me, it all goes hand in hand. They've got to be mixed up. They've got to play in different places. Now, high school, because they're more specialized, it really depends on the situation. But to me, it's, I mean, go where you normally play. We still might move you once we start the season. For our team, you might be a better fit somewhere else. But in terms of trying out, like, go where you normally are, because at that point, you should know where your strong suit is. Um, so my question there was just um... – it wasn't really a question. It was just kind of to back up what you said, you know, what a lot of, especially the younger kids, you know, Oh, I play offense. I, you know, I, I score the goals. That's me. You know, I go and I score all the goals. Um, they don't understand that. If, if I can look at you and say, Hey, where do you play on the field? And you can say to me, I play right wing and I play some right back. And, you know, when I need to, I can slide into the center. Well, that is just a leg up on making a team. You know, when you get into those competitive teams, because now I can play Katie in multiple spots on the field. So, you know, being able to adapt to multiple positions, even if it's just two positions, I can play the center mid or I can play the center back. You know, I like to be in the center of the field, but I can play either one of those. It just gives you a leg up on a lot of competition, especially as you get older. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's a part of parent education and a part of player education that people miss. Yeah. As, especially now we see like the, you need to individualize one sport. You need to be in one position. You need a private train to be a forward at four years old. Right. And so it's like, we've lost the piece of getting a holistic view of the game. And like I said, and like you just said, I mean, you're, you're hitting it on the head. Like the more you know about the game, the better off you're going to be in the long run. And so that's where like me coaching middle school, I tell my kids all the time, you guys are playing in more than one position because you're going to be better off for it. You might not think so. You might get frustrated, but in the long run, when you get into high school, if you can play striker and you can play outside mid, now you've got double the chance to make a team because you're not right. fighting for one spot. So I think that's a big thing that a lot of people miss, but it's very true and is something that we should absolutely be telling youth players that are in middle school and below because it's, I mean, it makes a huge difference when you get into the, the higher levels for sure. So let's start looking at the other side of tryouts, the side that frustrates us. So for me and Coach Hamilton, uh, one thing that bothers us is clubs that come into tryouts unprepared or unorganized. And, you know, at the 11th hour, the DOC, whoever it is, is saying, all right, you go to that field and you go to that field and it's just chaos. What are some things that you've encountered either in your playing career or in your coaching career that either has frustrated you or you said to yourself, why are we doing it this way? And it's just driving you crazy. Anything that you've encountered along your way? 
I totally agree with you. I think the organization piece is big. I think when you have a tryout, that is your first impression to people that are coming to your club. So it should be organized to be run. If I go to a tryout and it's not organized, I know that the club is kind of a mess. And so I think that that's a big, big piece. Like I said earlier, one thing that really bothers me is when coaches, so let's say I'm taking over the team that Chris had last year, right? And Chris comes to me, okay, well, these players were on the top team and this player plays in this position and this player plays here. So if we are both aiming to create a team that's going to have success and we're trying to develop players, right? Then first of all, we may have different ideas and how that works. But we might see the game differently. We may see things differently. My style of play may be different. So a player that might be a good striker for you might be a good attacking mid for me. And then also a player that was maybe a role player for you may not fit into the mold that I have, right? And so I think that it's really important when you've got coaches to make sure that they are evaluating for themselves. I cannot tell you how many conversations I've been a part of where before tryouts have even happened, we're talking about, oh, well, this player is getting moved up to the top team. This player is getting dropped down to the middle team. Why and how do you know that? And don't get me wrong. I understand that the performance throughout the year is going to dictate that movement a little bit. But the reality is everyone should be starting on a blank slate when we're at tryouts. It's not realistic, but that's that's how it should be in an ideal world. So for me, when a new coach is taking over a team, I think other coaches overstepping and trying to guide them in one direction. I think another thing that really frustrates me is when you have directors that buy into the political piece. So we're evaluating and it's like, hey, this kid's dad coaches a team here. So he really needs to be on the top team, you know, because once again, that's not fair and that's not how it should be. And then I think the other side to it is when the coaches tell their kids, so like, all right, if you're on my top team, everybody wear pink to tryouts, right? So now the whole team's wearing pink. So everybody knows that that's the top team. And it's the same thing. It just puts everybody at a disadvantage. And really, it's just unfair to the new kids that are coming in. It's unfair to the kids that are coming back that are trying to get moved up. And ultimately, I just, once again, the bottom line is everyone should be evaluated with a clean slate. And I think that that just really does not happen enough. And that's probably my biggest complaint and grievance. And then the last thing I would say is player safety. I think that sometimes, and especially in club, club environments where they kind of already have their team picked, I think that tryouts can almost be taken, I don't want to say as a joke, but kind of, you know, they're coming out, they're scrimmaging, oh, we're just going to have them play. And then like, they're going to go home. And so the safety aspect can be lost. Like they're not properly warming up. They're not cooling down. They've got stuff thrown right next to the field that if a kid runs out of bounds, they're going to trip over. And so I think once again, that's your first impression as a club and like player safety should always be number one above anything else. So for me, that's huge. And actually I will add in one more when parents come to tryouts and watch and coach their kids from the sidelines. That is like the biggest red flag you could ever have. And every coach hates it. If I am thinking about putting your kid on my team and you are over on the sidelines telling them what to do during tryouts, I'm like, nope, you are gone. So I think that's a huge one that probably every coach can relate to is just the overbearing parents. And once again, tryouts is the club's first impression to you, but it's also your first impression to us. So if you're being a helicopter parent during tryouts, that's probably going to continue for the remainder of the season. And don't think that we don't notice that because we do. And we take it into account when we pick our teams and colleges as well. When we're recruiting, that's a big deal. If we're recruiting and your parents acting like a side, an idiot on the sideline, we're like, yeah. nope, don't want that kid in the program because we don't want to deal with it. Yeah, you've made a lot of great comments there. There on, on the parent issue on the college side, we've also spoke to another college coach, uh, Trip Rogers at Center College, said that almost verbatim. Like when he comes to watch a player, the first thing he's doing is finding mom and dad and saying, are they going mental? Are they chewing out the coach after the game? Are they busting up on the, are they not supporting their kid after a game or something like that? So I think that's a great point. The other thing I like that you brought up was the previous year's coach talking to the next year's coach, trying to show his bias. Well, you're kind of taking out the new kids that are showing up. 
What if you got some kid that just moved from another state and he's an ODP level player? Well, he's already taken that kid and put him on the second tier if he even stays with that club to begin with. So I love the points that you made there. A lot of great points. And I agree 100 percent. There needs to be a lot of organization and coaches need to just have their own point of view and run their own tryout instead of having this bias. And like you said, the political side of how things get run sometimes. Absolutely. Um, let's stick with the parent conversation. So I don't know. Um, you're down in Tennessee. You've coached in Tennessee. So let's just stick there. Let's just, uh, I don't know what it's like there. But for us, normally when we have like a middle school or even a high school tryout, um, parents aren't there. It's just the players. But on the club side of things, of course, we have the line of parents who are sitting there. Um, you know, let's put your DOC shoes on. If you're the DOC of, at a club, you know, how, how would you approach making sure or at least trying to limit those scenarios where mom and dad are doing the coaching during a tryout? I mean, here's the deal. As a DOC, your team, your prerogative, right? If you want to have parents showing up to your stuff, breathing down your neck, more power to you. But for me and my teams, it's not allowed. My parents, I tell them before tryouts, hey, tryouts, practices, closed. You're not welcome there. Don't show up. Drop your kid off. Go get your groceries. Go to the gym. Go do something because you're not going to sit here and bother us. Because once again, parent education, right? It takes away from the kid's experience. It distracts the kid from what we're working on. It frustrates them. A lot of times the parents that are like that are not the encouraging ones, right? They're the ones that are getting frustrated and living vicariously through little Timmy, who's just trying his best out there. And so I think it's really important that as coaches, you stand up for your kids. Because I think that ultimately, I mean, a kid cannot tell their parent, you being at tryouts really upsets me and makes me play worse, right? That's not gonna end well. So as a coach, you have to be the one to be like, hey, look, here is why you're not allowed here. You are not allowed here. And ultimately, like we said, if it's a problem, during tryouts, it's going to be a continued problem and you're not going to want them on your team. And I think like we were both saying, I mean, in college, this is really big. And this is the piece that people miss when you're, when your kid's being recruited, we pay attention to you and you might not think that, and you might not be paying attention, but on your point, Chris, of what you're saying earlier, how many kids do you go and recruit and their parents talk to you and they start dogging the high school coach? Oh, our high school coach really doesn't know what they're doing. Red flag. Like if you are going to sit there and talk crap about your high school coach, you would do the same thing to me. So I don't want you to be a part of my program. And I think that it, it's for me, the coach sets the tone. There are some coaches that are like, I want parents at everything because I want their support and sunshine and rainbows. And that typically ends pretty quickly, but there are coaches like that. And if you want to do that, Hey, rock on but for me my team not dealing with it it's way too much causes too much harm and really nothing good in my opinion comes from that i'm assuming that at your tryout are you having like a parent line like you can put in a rope up or putting paint line on a field saying parents cannot cross this line once your kid is registered or are you saying for tryouts drop your kid off stay in the parking lot come back in an hour how are you approaching that so our rule for the clubs that I have been at at the past, or at least the rule that I have set as the coach has been like, you are not allowed on the field. And the way that it's set up is it's like a field and it's surrounded by other fields. So it's kind of like you can stay in the parking lot. There is a walking trail that sometimes parents will, oh, we're just going to go for a walk. And it's like, we know what you're doing, right? But for the most part, I mean, if you set that boundary, they will respect it. If you tell a parent, hey, look, we don't want you – at tryouts, you can stay in the parking lot, whatever, but you're not welcome on the field. They typically respect that. Sometimes you'll get some that'll stand off in the distance. And what I will do, if they're close enough, you've got to address it because if you let one, then more are going to come. They're like, they're like herds of sheep. If they see one sheep standing out there, all of a sudden you've got the whole freaking herd standing there together talking about tryouts and, oh, your kid's looking really good. Oh, your kid's looking great too. So when you see it, you go over, hey, just a reminder, they're closed. Can you do me a favor? Go to the parking lot, whatever. But I think when you set the boundary, I mean, for me, I've never had 
a scenario where if they do come and I tell them like, Hey, you've got to go that they haven't been able to respect that. And I think once again, it just goes down to setting the tone and they'll, they'll follow. Yeah. I, um, very similar when I moved, when I left the school side of things and came over to the club side of things, um, that first tryout and even my first practice, I look up and there's, you know, nine sets of parents standing around. I like, I texted my DOC and I was like, is this normal? Is this what we do? Why are all these parents here? And like the next week I closed my practice and the pushback at first was kind of like, you know, what the hell are you doing? Why are you closing practices? But once I explained to them, hey, I close practices because I, I'm the coach. You know, that's why you're paying me. You know, you're paying me to get the best out of your child on the field. So when you're there, that makes it harder for me to do. So I think you're right. Just being open and saying, hey, here's what we're doing helps that, you know, but it does. It has to be from the beginning and it has to be the same across the board. 100%. Let's, um, Let's move on. You mentioned cutting players, and it sounds like um, your I, your thoughts behind that are very similar to Coach Dunham and I. Um, Coach Dunham and I feel that at that youth level, so we're talking, I mean, really U11 and below, maybe even we stretch it to U12 and below, we should not be cutting players. Um, if a player shows up and they want to play soccer, then they should be allowed to play soccer. And it's our job to develop that skill. So – where are you kind of drawing that line where, okay, it is time to start cutting some players. You know, I'm playing 11 v 11 and I can't take 27 players, you know, to play on a middle school team. It's just, it just doesn't work. So where is it the middle school age? Where are you drawing that line? And then how do you go about that process? So for me, it is middle school. And my reasoning behind that is elementary school kids are kids, right? Let them play. It's important. You never know which ones are going to pan out, which ones are going to wind up not wanting to do sports at all. They should be able to try different things and figure out what they like. It helps get them outside, helps keep them out of trouble, all good things. And the same can be said for middle school. But where the difference comes in is when you get into middle school, now you have to prepare them for the next step. The next step is high school. The next step after that, for those that want it, is college. You will be cut in middle in high school. You will be cut in college. Middle school, you have to start preparing them for that. Middle school is that age where psychologically kids can start to bounce back a little bit more. They're a little bit more able to be resilient and be understanding and to understand when they don't make a team, they've got to work hard. And these are all things that are founded in research. And I think for me, this is why middle school, one of the many reasons why middle school is the most challenging yet rewarding and fun age to coach because this is the first time where parents are walking into a situation where equal playing time is no more cuts are happening and we are preparing your player for the next step, your child for the next step. And I think that for me, it once again, a lot of things for me come down to that open communication, but for me, players come in middle school level. Hey, listen, I'm going to tell you right now, at the middle school level, we begin making cuts because we want to prepare you for the next step. We want to get your child ready to go on to high school, to go on potentially further than that. And ultimately, the reality is when you get into middle school, dictated by tournaments, you can only bring typically a max of 22, sometimes 18. So you're really limited in that route right. anyway. And for me, this is where clubs have to ask, do they want to be money hungry and keep kids to make money? And, and some middle schools as well that pay to play. Or do you want to develop kids? We have in our system, we have two middle schools for our same area. And I coach one and there, somebody else coaches the other. On our middle school teams, they pay to play at the school. They pay a fee. And that fee is in large part what pays me as the coach. And I only keep 18 kids because for me, I want to keep the best 18, develop them and use them to go forward. And like I said, I'm not just going to keep kids for the sake of keeping them. I also think when you get into middle school and you want to develop kids, it can become harder to keep them focused when you have an overload of kids. I think that the skill gaps also become a lot more evident when you're in elementary school, everybody's kind of learning the same thing. When you're in elementary school, they're all goofing around. When you start to get into middle school, you have players that want to develop. You have players that want to get better. And those players' focus level and their skills, they start widening the gap. 
And when that gap gets so wide, you have to start making cuts so that you can keep the players that want to develop and want to stay engaged, engaged, and you can develop them further. So for me, all of those reasons play a part into why we start making cuts at that age. But it's just having that communication of like, we are cutting them and this is why. And ultimately, if you don't make a team, here are your other options. Because there are always other options. You can go and play rec. You can do private training. I was cut from my middle school team when I was in sixth grade. It was the best thing that ever happened to me, right? So I think that you have to kind of coach those parents, give that education, coach the players, and give the expectation on the front end. And then as things unfold, I think when you have the open communication, it gets easier to understand on the back end. Yeah, you know, we um, we joke around a lot and, you know, with the cutting and things like that, um, we just spoke to another coach earlier who was a DOC in Maryland and, you know, he, he labeled tryouts as the worst time of the year because, you know, there are tough decisions that have to be made. There are those Un, you know those not fun conversations that as coaches we ha we have to have because we owe it to the players that are there or that have been with us um, that aren't going to be moving forward with us and although it's hard it is necessary and you're right just that open communication is so so important I want to go back to your tryout process real quick because this has been an interesting question for me and I'm sorry if you uh, answered this earlier but so you're running trials. You have your 11 v 11 kids, or you have your 11 v 11 going on. What does um, what does the evaluation process look like for you? Are you doing the evaluating? Are you having other coaches do the evaluating? Is there a group of you? You know, I know some coaches like to um, like. For me personally, you know, we talked about that coaching bias. You know, this past tryout, I had. Uh, Coach Dunham and I had three or four other coaches come and actually do my evaluation because I've had these girls for two years. I knew I was going to have to make some really tough cuts. So I didn't want to do the evaluating because I didn't want my biases to get in the way. So what does that look like for you during your tryout? So I think it really depends on the setup of your club. For me personally, I don't let my bias get in the way of anything. So like I could be with a team for five years and go and evaluate them. And I'm just going to shoot it straight. That's just the kind of person I am. And I think that obviously relationships can hinder that. And there may be biases that I don't cognitively recognize. But I think that for the most part, I've always tried to be somebody that's just very level and open-minded. And so I think the setup of your club matters in terms of like, if you've got a top team, a middle team, and a bottom team all three coaches should be doing evaluations. And ultimately, if you're looking at the same thing, hypothetically, you should be coming up with the same conclusions, but due to style of play, there may be a bit of different variations. Like if you're a top team coach and you prefer really fast players, even if they're not as skilled, but they're super quick versus you want a technical team, you're gonna be looking for a different profile of player. But I think that all three coaches in that instance or top team, middle team, both coaches, are looking at the same kids. And ultimately what I do and what I think should be done is everybody should make a list. So like, these are my top 18 kids. And then after that, these are my next 18 kids. For me, 18 is the magic number if you haven't picked up on that by now. Yeah. So, you know, 18, my 18, and then here are the next ones. And then here are the third set of 18. And then from there, you kind of just go and whoever is the first team coach, they pick their 18 and they get their responses back. They might bleed into the next group a little bit. Once they've got those set, then the second team coach says, okay, who's left that they didn't pick? And then you go from there. So I think ultimately the head coaches of each team should be evaluating for their own teams by themselves, getting a list, and then they should make their team's decisions based on that. And I think if you're in a situation like you were where you felt you couldn't really give an unbiased opinion, there's nothing wrong with having other coaches come in and evaluate. But the reality is if you're going to do that, you've got to listen to them, right? You can't be like, well, you said this girl's not, but I know she is, right? Like if you're going to give that responsibility to someone else and you've got to trust it. So I think that it's not a bad idea, but I think sometimes, I mean, if you don't take their advice, it's kind of a, I mean, you're not really doing yourself a favor. So. Right. I'm going to go. Yeah, I think you I'm explained that really well. Outside. No, you're fine. Yeah, I think you explained that really well, um, bringing in other evaluators and, you know, your own bias type of situation. So the other area of tryouts that we haven't brought up with is the goalkeepers. So 
clearly, you know, U10 and below goalkeepers, you shouldn't have a defined goalkeeper. U12, that may get a little bit more defined, but they should still be on the field a little bit. How do you approach figuring out goalkeepers at the middle school and high school age? And is there a way you approach that differently in your tryouts? So in my experience, and this is just me, we have very limited access to goalkeepers. And I've been at bigger clubs. I've been at smaller clubs. I've been at, you know, public 6A public schools. And ultimately, the access to keepers and just the amount of keepers is so small that there really aren't that many. So in my experience, I don't actually know if I could ever say that I've cut a goalie. Every goalie that I've had try out for middle school and high school, they've been either the only one or one of two, and they're just kind of getting placed on a top team or a middle team, and that's it. So if I were in a situation where I had to evaluate goalies, then I would bring in a goalie coach because they know more than I do. The bottom line is I'm not a keeper coach, and I think that a lot of coaches get stuck on – they're not keeper coaches, but like they can evaluate a goalie. But I think ultimately you can't because you don't know that much. And I have a lot of coaching friends that in tryouts for, let's say they have two goalies, right? One's on a top team, one's on a middle team. They just stay there. They don't ever switch them around or whatever because they just kind of keep them where they're at. And I think that's where you can bring in somebody specialized in that to evaluate them to figure out, okay, which one do you think is better as a goalie coach? And then you listen to that opinion and you go from there. But once again, that goes back to you have to trust others and you have to be open to their perspectives. And sometimes coaches just aren't willing to do that when it comes to their own team. Um, Coach, we, you've mentioned a few times where you've coached um, both boys and girls. I think I know the answer to this for you, but are you approaching tryouts any differently knowing you're going in to select a girls team versus selecting a boys team? No, for me, it's really all the same. And I think that, I mean, the personalities are different, but the game stays the same. You know, you can go more in depth with certain groups than others, but that's true for the same gender, different gender. It's, it all goes down to what the kids know and meeting them where they're at. So for me, tryouts look the same. The ideal tryout would look the exact same. You would put them in a scrimmage, you would evaluate them and you would go from there. And I think that really, I mean, coaching boys and girls, you have to treat them different in terms of interactions, but the actual coaching is in large part the same. All right. We will hold there with coach Katie Smith, assistant coach at Arkansas State University. A great conversation there with her, kind of a different perspective from previous guests we've had, Coach Smith wants to go full field almost immediately, and then she's going to break it down from there. So real interesting there, a lot to unpack that we will do in a future episode. We appreciate you being here with us. We look forward to continuing this tryout conversation, looking at a little more of the perspective from the player side of things when it comes to trials. This is the Ace Football Academy, and as always, we are brought to you by ANC Car Wash, locally owned and operated here in Richmond, Kentucky. Please make sure you go and see them for all your car washing needs. This has been the Ace Football Academy, Coach Hamilton, Coach Dunham. We appreciate you for listening.